Hi, welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm Colleen Stover. Today, we are continuing the conversation about how the United States Space Force is reinventing the launch arena. The future vision of assured access to space involves things like increasing the pre-launch satellite processing, rapid delivery, responsive launch, mobility in space like cargo transport and on-orbit servicing like refueling, and finally, exciting things like multi-use range facilities, including commercial, of course, spaceports, if you will. Or what about a whole network of spaceports? So earlier, we talked to Major General Stephen Purdy of the Eastern Range in Florida, and now we speak to the commander of the Western Range and Space Launch Delta 30, Colonel Robert Long. He's at Vandenberg Space Force Base on the beautiful central coast of California, which is also wine country, if you didn't know already. So leading the conversation, we have Aerospace's Richard Lamb. He's Systems Director of our Launch Operations Division. Let's get started. Thank you, Colleen, for that introduction. Uh, it's a, it, as a Western Range alumnus uh, from Vandenberg Space Force Base, it's an honor to uh, chat with Colonel Rob Long, the commander of Space Launch Delta 30 and the director of the Western Range today, and continue the conversation of the uh, reinventing assured access to space vision that Major General Purdy laid out in a recent uh, webcast. Colonel Long, welcome. Thanks, Rich. Uh, thanks for hosting and uh, looking forward to the conversation today. You bet, sir. Um, in the Center of Space Policy and Strategies recent webcast, Major General Purdy laid out uh, three mission areas of the Assured uh, Access to Space division that he oversees. Um, and in it, of course, is the um, space access, uh, rapid delivery, and orbital, orbital resiliency. It'll be interesting, I think, for our audience to hear your thoughts on how you, what's your vision for navigating the uh, Space Launch Delta 30 through uh, these mission areas. Historically, uh, Vandenberg has been a hub of our launch and had been essentially our spaceport and a big test uh, entity. But now with the evolving missions, what's your vision for Space Launch Delta 30 in the Vandenberg community, sir? Yeah, and again, thanks, Rich. I appreciate uh, uh, the aerospace and everybody putting this on. It's uh, It's been fun and uh, I'm looking forward to a good conversation. Yeah, you know, when we consider the where uh, General Purdy's vision is for short access to space or ATS, um, it's really exciting times. Uh, I, you know, have 20 something years of, of launch experience. And, uh, and I would say this is the most dynamic time we've really seen recently. And, and really what it comes down to it though, really, right. We're, we're fundamentally about being a spaceport and a test range, um, mm -hmm. at least from the assured access or AETS perspective, you know, our role is to provide that platform, right. To get to space, um, and to provide those services that, uh, customers need, in order to do space launch. Uh, and of course, we also have the test mission as well. So, you know, ultimately our vision really comes back to just being, you know, we wanna be the, the range of choice or the spaceport of choice uh, for, for customers, especially in the market area that we see is, is really kind of our niche, which is of course, polar orbit right. uh, satellites. And, and then of course, our test mission out over the Pacific Ocean. So, you know, with that vision in mind, you know, we're, we're ultimately really just trying to get to that point where We've maximized the range capacity. You know, we're in a launch on demand kind of state where we can literally be called up at any time or in, uh, and you've heard General Purdy say this recently too, you know, in a freight train or a regularly scheduled uh, transportation kind of model that, you know, we just, we're launching once a day, right? And at that point in time, then it just becomes kind of like an airport uh, where aircraft take off and land. Uh, and it's nothing that is really unique anymore. It's just part of one, another mode of transportation, and, and we're we're taking whatever we need to take to uh, to low Earth orbit in that case, maybe or somewhere else. So it's exciting, you know. Like I said, and, and I'm really excited to be uh, a part of it. And it's fun to sit here in this seat and uh, and kind of hopefully chart a course that uh, will take us into the future for uh, for spaceport operations and uh, here at Vandenberg. Yeah, indeed. I think uh, the, the future looks bright for the Central Coast of California and Vandenberg Space Force Base. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to see what the next few years bring to you all. Uh, you know, last uh, the last presentation, General Purdy kind of gave an Eastern Range perspective. I'd like to maybe get dive deeper in the Western Range perspective from um, and there are a lot of similarities between both ranges, but there are also many differences. 
And I think sometimes folks overlook the differences. So would you speak to our audience a little bit about differences in terms of your customer base? Uh, certainly you've got space operators and Department of Defense test and evaluation programs. Um, talk a little bit about how your, your terrain and um, your location, you've mentioned the polar orbit, that's where the location comes into play. And, and just talk about some of the other differences that set you all apart and, and give you an opportunity to support our assured access to space from the West Coast. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Rich, for that question. Yeah, you know, when you think about uh, where we sit on the Central Coast, uh, one thing that is exactly similar between East Coast and West Coast is, you know, our number one job ultimately comes down to public safety and making sure when we do all these right. space launches, especially, right. or test missiles, um, that we're doing it safely and we're protecting the public. So that, you know, that route is 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 fundamental to everything that we do. And, okay, and that also helps with our location, as you mentioned, right? Being here on this the little corner of California affords us the opportunity to launch to the south, for example, and we don't really cross a landmass uh, until Antarctica. Uh, so that's a lot of open ocean, and that provides a lot of uh, extra margin when we talk safety. And and that really is fundamentally kind of where we started at. Um, and, you know, going all the way back in our history, the 1950, late, uh, late 1950s, um, you know, we were able to then take advantage of our location um, to launch out over the ocean. So that was really where it started. And that's where we carry on today. But you're right that <clears throat> when we consider just Vandenberg as a location, you know, we have 100,000 acres across right. the entire base and uh, roughly split north to south. And most of our space launch now is on the south, southern part of our base, which affords a, a, a good standoff distances between uh, launch pads and, and future launch sites. Um, right. It really helps us deconflict. We aren't really congested uh, on, the, on the west coast like you might find more so on the east coast. Um, and that's just it allows us a lot of flexibility and agility, really, in, in being able to move a, a bit faster. Um, and then we can also separate kind of our test mission, right? So you mentioned the differences between the two coasts, and we are uh, have a pretty heavy presence from our ICBM test mission and our missile defense uh, test mission. Um, so those two uh, types of programs, our space launch and our test, tend to be the two that we balance quite a bit between requirements, uh, of course, uh, operations tempo, and, uh, and and just making sure that we are always uh, providing the services that we want to provide for all of those customers, and that fits hopefully within you know whatever we would want to consider as a spaceport model. So, but when you consider the hundred thousand acres, you know one of the great things about being here at Vandenberg is we live on a on a pristine piece of California, um, and I'm actually pretty proud about the stewardship that uh, the base and, and my predecessors um, have taken in, in in caring for this land and making sure that we're doing right by. Uh, this the the natural environment that we have right. here in California. It's, it's 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 as as we were talking earlier. You know, it's one of the best, um, most pristine, you know, unique places to 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 live anyway. And it's just a wonderful place to live. And but you know, with that, you know, the especially on the environmental side, right? The re regulatory process can be a little bit more onerous at times. Um, we have an amazing team that will get through that mm -hmm. uh, pretty predictably. Uh, but that does probably throttle right? The amount of development that can go on out here um, at this part of California. Um, and so we take that into account, obviously, uh, you know, when we're when we're planning for the future. Uh, and, you know, I think we try to do our best to balance all of those different equities when we talk about what it looks like um, to in order to build the spaceport here on this part of California. Well, thanks, uh, Colonel Long. That's a great uh, perception, that, a perspective that you bring uh, to, to this conversation. But uh, talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, the Eastern Range has the combination with Kennedy Space Center, uh, and, and their location is getting very congested. Most of their launch sites have been allocated and taken up. And at Vandenberg, you've got a, a little bit more opportunity for expansion, but that comes with the challenges that I think you just spoke to about development and uh, continuing to take care of the environment and doing the development with uh, responsibility. So uh, what, what do you see the opportunities of, of getting additional launch service providers or other uh, space uh, businesses that might flow out there as part of the coming in space economy? Yeah, you're right, uh, Rich, that, uh, you know, when you compare and contrast the two coasts, um, obviously the demand signal on the East Coast is a little bit different. And and obviously the land size is different. And so uh, just, you know, kind of from a basic standpoint, right, that, you know, the, the amount of space available on the East Coast is is starting to dwindle. 
um, and those relationships between both uh, Cape Canaveral and, and uh, Space Launch Delta 45 and Kennedy Space Center, for example, are, are even more so important as they consider what that future development looks like. Of course, out here on the West Coast, uh, I've got plenty of land, as I mentioned, you know, across 100,000 acres. Uh, but, you know, most of that land is undeveloped. And undeveloped land means you got to go through the entire environmental process in order to build, uh, which is, you know, we uh, we always follow through on all that. And, and in fact, the, the, the great thing about the team here is they are experts in, in managing through those processes. So while sometimes we get feedback that um, those processes can be a bit onerous and, and, and time consuming, um, they exist for a reason. And, uh, you know, so we just do our best to inform and advise uh, new companies that might come out here. Um, how to navigate that appropriately, uh, put the right protections in place. And then usually what I usually tell uh, if I'm talking to some prospective launch customer or, or company that might be looking to launch from, from Vandenberg is I, I just remind them that, you know, predictability actually has some value when you're running a business, right? Um, you know, that's the key part is we try to be predictable on our on our regulatory processes so that we can at least offer that. We, we may not know, they may not move as fast as they want, uh, especially in the kind of new space era where everyone's trying to get, get uh, uh, you know, new startups and, and new companies are coming along and they're trying to move as fast as they can. Sometimes the those some of those regulatory processes can be a little bit daunting. And so we hope that we're able to uh, offer them some, our expertise, guide them through that process in a predictable manner so that they can ultimately succeed and get to whether it's groundbreaking or whatever else they want to do out here. So, you know, it's one thing I've learned in my time here is, you know, we have a we have a great group of experts on the team. Um, and, I'm you know, when we talk about range services, for example, or spaceport services, I view that as one of our key services, the ability to guide uh, prospective companies, you know, through that entire process and get them to uh, ultimately launching, right? Because that's what we want um, from a national security perspective. Yes, and it, there's great opportunities as um, the satellite constellations that need to be delivered. There's thousands of satellites being planned. The FCC has pro approved those. Um, the future looks very bright and vibrant for uh, the, the space and the, the launch business. Um, but that also brings to the point that you know, historically at, at Vandenberg, you all have launched um, anywhere from 10 to 15 launches a year. And a lot of those were Department of Defense test and evaluation missions or national security space launches. In recent years, the, 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 the coins being flipped, uh, we're starting to see a lot more commercial launches. And although certainly the East Coast is uh, outpacing in terms of the commercial launches, the growth for you and the projections of uh, the commercial launch operators launching commercial missions from Vandenberg is also starting to, to, to go. You went from 10 or 15, last two years, you you hit, uh, broke 20 launches each year and projections show that you'll, you'll probably hit 40 this year and be at 40 to 50 the next couple of years. And then in the out years, we even project maybe 70 to 100 launches. It's um, I talked to the audience a little bit about the recent uh, com communications that you've had with local leaders, uh, that the group REACH and the state of California leaders up in Sacramento to help them appreciate that there's this coming space economy and that Vandenberg might uh, represent an opportunity to partner with uh, you and the base uh, to maybe see if there's a, an attraction for more missions and, and more opportunity for jobs out there in the Central Coast. Over. Yeah, Rich, it's a good point. You know, you, you, you nailed it when you talk about uh, our launch tempo and our launch rate increasing. You know, we in, in just the time I've been here, you know, we, we've doubled year over year, uh, we doubled from last year from the year before. And, and as you mentioned, we're expecting to double again here this year. And as you mentioned there, the, the projections are that 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 doesn't that is going to slow down anytime in the near future. And I add on, actually on top of that, right? Uh, with the new Sentinel uh, ICBM program coming online, we're going to see an increased demand signal from that program as well to do test uh, launches from here. Meanwhile, you know the missile defense agency is looking at uh, a next generation interceptor. We may see we'll see how that plays out, but we would expect them to run a test regime from from Vandenberg as well. And so, yeah, there's a it's a real dynamic time. It's a fun time, as I mentioned earlier. 
uh, to be here. But you know, when you when you when you look at that demand signal, there's 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 probably some constraints overall in in terms of moving uh, expanding even more. I mentioned the re- regulatory regime is one of those, but even just things like access to talent, right? Bringing in people, and uh, we are a little isolated here on our little little awesome part of California. Uh, but you know, bringing in talent, you know, I, you know, we talk about housing. We talk about all of the things that that families care about. Um, you know, when they're looking to move to an area, and you know, when you talk to uh, all of our launch providers out here, you hear the same kinds of themes in terms of, hey, there are something that I uh, I need uh, from the local area. Whether I want good schools for my kids, I want reasonably affordable housing, cost of living. Um, so you know, when you when you talk about competing in a marketplace for uh, talent in order to bring that the best talent to support our mission. Obviously, I think we're a little challenged when you especially when you compare us to other parts of the country. Um, but you know, for all of that, we still are, are moving quickly and we're still building and you know we were up and we have good relationships with our local community, an amazingly supportive local community here on the Central Coast. It's a, it is truly a great place to live. Um, and you know we have got great representative uh, support from our uh, representatives in Congress. Uh, in the Senate as well. And, and as you mentioned, you know, uh, had some good, we have good discussions with the state as well. And, and to the to the end that to the point anyway, that, um, you know, the California's come, they've come out with a, what they call a state space industry task force, which is going to be generally focused on trying to improve opportunities in areas like Vandenberg, where, you know, when you consider there are, there's two large space ports probably in the nation right now. And there's probably four relatively developed when you include Alaska and Virginia in that. Um, you know, there's just very few places to do this. And, and especially when you, you couple that with uh, the aerospace industry that's already here in the state of California, right? You know, it, it's it's sometimes puzzling when I've seen in the past, you know, a company that might be building uh, their launch vehicles in, in, in California take them to Alaska or something like that to launch and when we're right down the road, right? Uh, at least uh, relatively close by. So yeah, anyway, I think the state of California realizes that and they've put some effort behind doing that. Um, you know, we're looking forward to working with them and we do have a lot of really great local uh, development agencies like uh, Reach, for example, who's right in there with us, you know, looking for those opportunities where we can kind of continue to build the local economy, which then attracts the talent and then makes us really successful in the long run. So, you know, it's definitely not um, uh, the, uh, it is a, a, a very uh, wicked problem. It's a very complicated problem when you're, when you're considering the, econ- the econo- uh, economic development in the local area, and then working with all the different groups that have uh, pieces and parts to that. So it's, it's fun I mean, from, from the standpoint of the seat that I sit in, but yeah, at the same time, there's definitely a lot of pieces and parts that uh, that drive that uh, equation. And then, that's a similar story that we hear often from other spaceport directors around the country. Um, but I do think uh, one of the, the things that we will need to navigate as a nation is uh, how do you develop uh, space enterprise zones, commercial enterprise zones around spaceports? Because uh, there's going to have to be some kind of complementary activities to uh, for the for the future missions that are coming. Well, talk to us a little bit about uh, some challenges um, that that you might be dealing with that the audience might be interested in. Challenges in terms of either uh, payload processing capacity or utilities or commodities. What are some of the challenges you'd like the audience to appreciate that you all deal with uh, out there at the Western Range? Yeah, no, you know, and I and I wanted to kind of go back to you know. The ecosystem that we have slowly developed, I think, over time here has been great because we have real great relationships. Um, I mentioned REACH, but I also forgot to mention uh, some of the local universities. So when we talk about bringing talent on board, you know, we do live in a pretty vibrant uh, area, um, but we're also competing for that same talent with any number of technology uh, companies overall. So, you know, I think generally one of the key challenges is just making sure that, you know, we are fostering an area that is uh, uh, appealing to talent, right? But then on top of that, right, you know, uh, most of the, the infrastructure on Vandenberg was was is largely built um, from the space shuttle era when the space shuttle was going to launch off the West Coast. And and over time, of course, you would you would expect, you know, we're in one of the most corrosive environments in the Department of Defense here on the on the uh, Western coast because of the marine layer that brings effectively a salt fog that comes in. So we would deal with all those kinds of problems, uh, much like any base does. But when you have, like, for example, 600 miles of roads right in, uh, across our uh, entire base, that's just a challenge that any infrastructure 
uh, uh, work will 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 come along with that. So we're we're constantly battling that, and, and that's an area where we're we're really focused. Uh, there was some work done um, in the 2009-2010 era on our electrical infrastructure, for example, that really it was starting to go even uh, uh, downhill in terms of uh, 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 reliability. And we made some strategic investments back then. And have we and I, I, the success story I like to tell there, though, is that those strategic investments actually have have borne fruit now. But it's taken eight to ten years, right? Because it's just a long process to get through that. And so as we look ahead, um, in in terms of what infrastructure, and really when we consider what kind of um, what are the needs when we want to get into operating through a contested or a degraded type of environment, especially when we talk about future pacing threats. You know, that's the kind of thing that we, you know, energy resilience becomes key, right? And so we've got some programs uh, and some ideas and projects that we're working on in order to, you know, we have a solar farm, for example, and that solar farm would, would power us during the day, but we still need a, the PG&E or the local commercial power signal in order to sync that, right? So we're going to work through some, we have some concepts in development right now uh, that'll help us uh, potentially, you know, if we lost commercial power from, from uh, off, off base, then we would be able to sustain operations based on our solar farm, batteries, those kinds of microgrid type of options. So, so there's a lot. We have a lot in the hopper. Water resilience is another great example of the challenges we face out here. Obviously, uh, although we have been extremely fortunate with rain of late, um, you know, we are still in a drought situation here in California. And so we're exploring things like desalination, uh, desalinization, right? And we have some some projects so that we're looking at right now that. That that actually could be uh, fruitful in terms of using the, some of our offshores uh, access to the offshore area here uh, to bring some of that uh, fresh water back. So so I'm real hopeful that some of the you know, we're we've learned some of those lessons from our infrastructure um, challenges in the past. We we've tried to do some strategic planning in the future. But I think really when I talk about like what our challenges are in order to achieve our vision of of launching you know regularly once a day kind of thing. But those are many of the things that we're really going to have to uh, work through, which is talent, right? We got to have the right people to do that, and then it's the infrastructure there in order to support that. So, uh, you know, it's 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 great to have this conversation right now because I think we're still, you know, in that point where we can affect change and then set ourselves up really for a, a great future. Yeah, thanks for that. Let's uh, pivot now to uh, the United States Space Forces uh, Spaceport of the Future Initiative. Uh, as you know, the our first uh, chief of space operations established a, uh, a vision for us to evolve our ranges into future spaceports. Um, it, he was instrumental in, in uh, last year getting the FAA's associate administrator for commercial space transportation to establish the National Spaceport Interagency Working Group, tasked to create an aspirational vision for, for our nation's spaceports. Um, and of course, the NISWIGs are made up of representatives from Department of Commerce, Department of State, Department of Transportation, Department of Defense, NASA, and, and, and Aerospace. A great team working on that strategy document. Uh, similarly, uh, Director uh, Dr. George Neal, the director of the Global Spaceport Alliance, published a paper in, in support of the FAA on network of spaceports. Talk to us a little bit, uh, since you've been navigating this and participating in these discussions, Talk to the audience a little bit about this opportunity for the nation to maybe establish a network of spaceports uh, and, and acknowledging the variety of spaceports from horizontal launch to vertical launch to enterprise zones, et cetera. Yeah, no, I think you hit a nail on the head there. You know, it's the network piece, right, that is most important. And when we talk about resilient uh, operations from a national security perspective, especially, right, you know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? You don't want to have all equatorial launches go from the, the eastern uh, Cape Canaveral, and you don't want all polar launches, for example, launching from California. So you want to look at that diversity and build that in. So, you know, he heaven forbid we have an earthquake here or, you know, for example, the East Coast has a hurricane and, you know, that's just going to shut down operations for a period of time. Um, I think we'll be resilient and we'll be able to work through most of those things. But but you don't want to you don't want to get yourself in a situation where you do that. So that's where I think it's extremely important to work with um the working group in order to develop the strategy of what that looks like in the spaceport across the nation maybe across with our allies and foreign partners as well right we don't want to limit that i think there's a lot of growth opportunities in a lot of those areas 
And so then for, you know, for example, if you, if you take like Alaska, for example, right, and, and you know, Alaska and, and Vandenberg per, perhaps are complementary in terms of capabilities at some point in the future, or Virginia and Cape Canaveral, you can pick any number of places, you know, Australia is interested, I know the UK is interested, um, there's any, as you mentioned, there's a host of, of spaceports across the country. And so when you look at the entire life cycle, and especially as we move down the road of what does launch and, and space access, space mobility look like? You know, there, there, there could come that time, right, where we're only needing to launch vertically to lower Earth orbit, right? And everything else is maybe a horizontal, you got things landing on the ground. So, so you're going to want to have some sort of um, diverse network of locations. Um, you know, I always tell our folks, right, you know, the, the, the U.S. Air Force back in my previous Air Force days, right, didn't have just one Air Force base, right? We have tens and dozens and hundreds of them. So, uh, and that's on on, on purpose, right? Um, it's it's kind of one of those uh, doctrinal terms, right? In terms of uh, mass maneuver, you want to make sure you you have diversity across your force, right? To, it just makes sense. So yeah, so I'm really excited about uh, where the the National Spaceport Working Group is going. Um, I think it's it's going to be you know Dr. Neil uh, is is probably spot on in in terms of his perspective on where we need to go. Um, obviously, there's going to be some challenges, right? We got to figure out what are those standards, right? How are we all going to operate, right? Just like an airport operates or a seaport operates, right? You know, the, I think that's probably our first task. And I think, you know, as you know, we're working on some of those concepts to try to figure out what, what is the most common. I think, you know, you can you can tease out things like safety is always going to be probably a primary uh, commonality. And we have some of those laws and rules in place already from the FAA and, of course, DOD. Um, so I think it, over time, I think we'll develop that and, and, and more the you know, when you go back, as you mentioned, when you're in the lead in, you know, the range of the future and the spaceport of the future initiatives, the entire purpose of that, right, was to remove the range, remove the spaceport as the constraint to launch, right? We wanted to get ourselves out of, not get ourselves out of the business, but make sure we were being most efficient. And so when you use that kind of thinking uh, moving forward with our national spaceport, right, really what you want is, is make it as easy as possible for our commercial launch providers and customers, ultimately, um, to, to launch when they need to, right? And, and get into that freight train mode or, or those tra traditional uh, transportation modes so that they are, you know, again, because we're not the constraint anymore, you know, anyone can take off and land uh, going to and from space, just like they do to and from air. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, recently you and I had the opportunity to be at the inaugural Space Mobility Conference and I uh, got to hear uh, General Purdy, General Shaw and General Whiting uh, give some good uh, talks of, of the coming space mobility uh, domain. Uh, real quickly, just give uh, the audience a little bit of your perspective. Since General Purdy spoke to the audience before the conference, you can now speak to the audience after the conference, give your perspectives on what you observe. But as a spaceport director, maybe talk about um, the need to be multimodal in order to support the space mobility domain that's coming. Yeah, you know, the Space Mobility Conference is great. And uh, I think you're right that, that it's exciting times to be part of this. And as we consider we're kind of our small piece in the overall, uh, you know, let's call it space access infrastructure, you know, I, you know, we've already proven here at Vandenberg that we can do, um, obviously, space launch is our, one of our core missions. Uh, we've returned the X-37, right? So we understand how, what it looks like to return from uh, space. And ironically, you can maybe even make an argument, the point-to-point -point kind of conversation that we've had, uh, you know, that's fundamentally what, what, what an ICBM test mission is, right? Is, is, is it launches from here and it goes somewhere else and, and comes back down. So obviously a little different. But in the long run, when we consider it under a space access infrastructure or architecture, um, I think it's there's a lot of similarities there, similarities there that we can already leverage things that we do here at Vandenberg. Yeah, and I think that plays into the uh, program that uh, Air Force Research Lab is uh, doing a Vanguard program on. That's rocket cargo. Give the audience a little appreciation of how you think you know the the space you have available at Vandenberg might play into a future rocket cargo program. Yeah, you know, I think, Rich, you're right that that as we look at Vandenberg, and again, I kind of go back to, to earlier comments just about the uh, amount of space we have, right? So if we're looking at either launching or landing some sort of um, cargo, right, in, in a traditional uh, transportation model, um, we are fortunate that we have plenty of land to work with. Um, and I can see a lot of uh, very many, uh, you know, um, uh, options or alternatives 
that allow us to to either support the Indo-Pacific region, right, because of just our physical location, uh, maybe in terms of timing, right, if that was if that was a critical requirement, for example, or in in parallel or in partnership with any other spaceport around the the world potentially, right. Um, so you can really kind of you know rocket cargo and those kinds of concepts uh, certainly allow some really forward thinking in terms of what does it look like to be a multimodal spaceport here you know we, we're really fortunate for example at, at our space launch complex six which used to be delta four originally built for the shuttle right it, it it shares really it is right next to the union pacific railroad for example right so there's you can start to see all these synergies when you talk about moving cargo around just like you would either on road by air or by sea right and so i, I i'm really excited as i said earlier about uh kind of the future of what some of these uh prototype programs uh, have to offer Right, you're right. You really are a truly multimodal uh, spaceport in the sense that you've got rail, sea, uh, uh, roads, uh, good highways, um, and you even got an airstrip. So you're able to bring in uh, cargo from anywhere and uh, connect it with the rocket to deliver payloads wherever they need to go. Well, Colonel Long, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you today, getting the Western Range perspective of the space mobility and the assured access to space. Uh, Colleen, I'm going to toss it back over to you. Well, thank you everyone for joining today's show. If you wanted to round it out with some insight from the Eastern Range at Cape Canaveral, be sure to check out episode 113 with Major General Purdy. You can get notified of new shows or browse them all by subscribing to our YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. And of course, more of our research is also available at csps.aerospace.org. Thank you to James Liggins, our technical director, and we'll see you next time.